Okay, according to the clock, it's uh, time to get started. So welcome to become a Visual Studio Power user. My name is Andrew Hall. I'm a program manager lead for the diagnostics team in Visual Studio. We own the debugging, profiling, and teletrace tools. And I'm Allison Buchholz Al. I'm a program manager on the Visual Studio platform team focusing on version control integration. Uh, I'm still what I like to call a brand new PM. I started about eight months ago. And before that, I really hadn't used Visual Studio, to be completely honest. So on my first day, when they said, fire it up, get started, I was like, what is this? There are so many buttons. What is everything? Um, and Andrew and I were talking about this the other day, and he told me this great story. Um, you know, there's this company. They have a supercomputer craziness. And one day, it just stops working. No one can figure out what's wrong. So they call in an expert consultant. He comes in presses a button on the wall, everything works perfectly. So he hands them their bill, and it's a million and one dollars. And they're like, how in the world are you gonna charge us a million and one dollars? All you did was press a button. So he's like, okay, let me break it down for you. Knowing what button to press, a million dollars. Pressing the button, one dollar. So what we're hoping is by the end of this, you will all have your own million dollar buttons to help you improve your productivity. Yeah, thanks Allison for the story. That, that's exactly right. We're hoping that you know Visual Studio is a huge product, there's a ton of functionality, so we're going to spend about 50 minutes today just looking at Visual Studio. We're going to spend about the first 45 minutes uh, just showing stuff that you can use today in Visual Studio 2015 through Update 2 that was shipped earlier this week. We're going to spend about the final five minutes looking at some cool new stuff in Visual Studio 15, the first preview of that ship this week as well. You may have seen it, you may have not, but we're really excited about some of the stuff we're doing there. Um, and then we're going to have, uh, tell you how you can help us improve Visual Studio in three minutes. So three minutes of your time after the talk, you can make Visual Studio a better product that more fully meets your needs. So with that, let's just jump right in and get started. Allison, um, now that we're here, we're in San Francisco, we're kind of near Sil Silicon Valley. I'm pretty inspired. Um, and, you know, we pick kind of an expensive hotel to stay in. Yeah, uh, it's a really so nice one, though. I was thinking maybe we could come up with a startup idea that could make us some money and help pay for our trip. I think our managers would like that a lot. Yeah, bon I smell bonus. I like the way you think. Um, so I was thinking, you know, Uber's pretty popular, Lyft, you know, these ride-sharing apps. So I'm sure all of our friends would love to take a ride with us after the talk. They could ask us some more questions as they go out to dinner, whatever their plans are tonight. So what do you think about starting our own Visual Studio Program Manager ride service? I think that's awesome. I mean, who wouldn't want to ride with our team? They're great. Exactly. <laughs> so um, I was prototyping this already, and I played with um, creating a WPF prototype that's consuming a web service that's already available. And do you have that available? I'd love to check it out. I, mean, I do. Check it out on this uh, USB drive right here. Awesome. We're really taking it old school, aren't we, Andrew? We are. <laughs> All right. So you said, you said WPF app? It's a WPF app, yep. OK. So how many people are going to call an Uber with their laptops? OK. How about we add some web front end so that people can use their phones like every other ride sharing app out there? I think we could probably do that. Okay. Sounds like a great idea. I, I feel like that's a good idea too. Okay, so through the magic of demos, right, I already have this loaded up on my machine. Unfortunately, the windows are a bit wonky. Sorry about that. I was coming from my multi monitor display here. But the great thing is with saved window layouts, I can easily get back to something like this. So you might have wondered how that happened. What we have here is if you go to Windows, you'll see this great sort of window layout section. And what I have already is this single monitor layout that I have saved for all the situations like this where I'm working just purely on my laptop. So I can click that and it applies it. The great thing is that you can create your own. So maybe perhaps, you know, when I'm working with anything in source control, I really like to pull out the changes pages from Team Explorer. I like to have that docked on the left here. I like my solution explorer on the right, my text editor in the middle when I actually load up my solution. And this is, you know, kind of how I like it. So what we can do is we can actually save this for future use. And you have two options. You can either go to window and hit save window layout. Or if you're a keyboard junkie, you can go with control Q, which launches quick launch right up here. And we can actually just type save window. And you'll notice it's one of my most recently used things. So save window layout, hit enter, and we're gonna name this demo source control. Ah, I can spell. Cool, so now that's saved, 
And if we actually go back and look at all our window layouts, they also have keyboard shortcuts. So I can very rapidly switch through with Control-Alt-1 to my single monitor, Control-Alt-2 to my multi-monitor craziness, or Control-Alt-3 to the one that we just created. So I'm actually gonna go back to Control-Alt-1, my single monitor, because that's what I like to use. Um, and actually, if you ever want to break these out onto another monitor, like actually pull this completely out of Visual Studio, save window layouts will also remember that. So awesome. Allison, real quick, I saw you did that quick launch thing um, yeah. and you were able to open the save window layout. What else can I do from the quick launch? So with quick launch you can do quite a bit. Um, any of the menu items here off these uh, menu bars are accessible through quick launch as well as anything in tools options because we know that that is crazy to get around in. So I was actually using quick launch to set up my environment variables and change my fonts earlier today. Very cool. Yeah, it's one of the best things ever. Control Q, don't forget it. So, now that we have this, you know, I want to make sure that my web stuff correlates with what you've already done. So is there maybe a file that you suggest I check out? Yeah, so in the shared library project, uh, right. there's a base request uh, class that you'll just be able to use to access all the web services. So it shouldn't require much work to just reconsume the web services that I, I was using in the WPF prototype. Cool, awesome. So I could just do a control semicolon to search through Solution Explorer um, for this base request file. But as we notice, there's a lot of stuff here, and I really don't want all that noise. So instead, what I'm going to do is you said shared library? Yep, shared library. Awesome. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna right click on this project and we're actually going to scope to this. And if you notice, that got rid of all the other noise of projects that I don't really care about at this point. They're still there, they didn't disappear forever. Um, but now when I do control semicolon to search through Solution Explorer for base request, Helps we know right. it helps if I spell it right. I know it shows up as the only thing. So now I can easily, you know, scroll through, take a look at all of the awesome logic that you put in here. Um, I did work very hard on it. I, we appreciate your work, Andrew. Um, so this is, you know, one way I could just scroll through. But another cool way um, that I like to use is actually replacing this scroll bar here. You know, this is just sort of gray. It's a little boring. I think we can make it more interesting. So I'm going to do Control Q again, and I'm going to type in Map Mode. And if you see here, we have this brings us up our tools option, you know, behemoth. And right here we have Use Map Mode for the vertical scroll bar. And what this does is it creates you know, sort of a zoomed out view of this code file. So now we can just roll over it and we get this sort of zoomed in preview so that we can easily skip to something that looks interesting. So, you know, maybe, oh, driver looks interesting. So I can scroll here. Um, and if you know that there's some longer function that you want to look at that easily shows up in map mode. So, you know, I think I think I'm feeling pretty good. I think that my map stuff, uh, my web stuff is all set to go. Let's give this a test run. So we're just gonna hit F5. This might take a couple seconds. Let's see. It's gonna start. Might have some performance issues we need to take care of. All right, so there I am. Awesome, for those of you who wanna ride with me, we're good. Okay, so I think we're all set to go. I could put this back on the flash drive for you, but I think we're gonna try and do something a little more modern and use VSTS if that's cool. Yeah. Okay, cool, we'll get into source control, we'll be good developers. So, let's get this into source control. Now, typically, what you might have done um, is right click, add to source control, connect to VSTS, create a team project. It's about 14 steps from beginning and end to get a solution not under source control into source control. But, something we've been working on is condensing that down to two. So if you'll notice down here in the status bar, we have this publish button. And if we go ahead and click it, what it's gonna do is wrap our entire solution in a Git repository, do an initial commit so that all that's left is add the remote. So what do I have to do to get that publish button, Allison? I haven't always seen that in Visual yeah. Studio. So actually, if you just use update two, the publish button is available now. It's also fully extensible for third parties. So this does not only support, it supports Git right now, but any third party source control provider can actually implement this. And as long as you have their extension um, installed, you'll be able to use this publish button to add your solution to the source control if you're choosing. 
Awesome. Very cool. So go cool. download update two to get uh, some of the Play cool stuff Allison showing. Yeah. So we see here we have, you know, VSTS. We also have GitHub. Um, I have the GitHub extension installed because I do some, you know, open source stuff every now and then. We're going to go ahead and use the VS Diagnostics team, which is what Andrew works on here. We're going to let this load up. Something like a network dependency and a demo. Oh, yeah. It's wonderful. And you know what? We already have this nice My Shuttle created here. So I'm going to call this build demo and with publish repository. Oh, no. Okay. It's awesome. It works. Awesome. It works. <laughs> we all love network dependencies, don't we? But it works because he's got it. So if you want a quick look of the things that we just went over, we have it here for the cool um, published feature that does work, I promise. Check out update two. And if it doesn't work, come talk to me. All right. So we're going to go ahead and, and roll forward now. Um, so I, ha I have the app that you, you pushed into source control. I have, have your changes now. So with the MVC app, so I'm going to go ahead and close Team Explorer here. Uh, let's click Start Debugging, and let's just see how it goes for us. So we're going to load up. It should take a couple seconds here. Yeah. And we should be up and running. And sure enough, uh, there we go. It's going to load you. And I see Ooh. your picture. Awesome. So let's go down and see who, what other drives we have. Um, OK. Hmm, that's strange. Let's be fluke. Did you actually test this with any other drivers, Allison? Uh, I tested the important people. Who were the important people? Uh, obviously me. OK, so <laughs> this only works for Allison, so we're going to figure out what's going wrong for, for everybody else. Um, I so I'm running Visual, using Visual Studio 2015 Enterprise, which means that I have uh, IntelliTrace. So IntelliTrace is collecting all the events. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on what I have so far here. And so let's go ahead and, and zoom out so I can see a, a timeline. And I can see that I have all these events. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. So we're going to, uh, oops, helps if I do that, just to this time. And I can see when events occur in time. And then down here in the table, I'm able to see if I drag this up a little bit. So let's go ahead and just customize this like that. That um, all of my ASP.NET events, and I can see that I have exceptions. So I can see the ASP.NET gets. I can see the posts, which is how we're sending the info for the driver that we want. And then I can see that I have some exceptions occurring. So there's a few posts that succeed. So for example, this post succeeds, no exception. But then this post, I can see that I have an exception thrown and an exception caught. Now the beauty of using IntelliTrace in Visual Studio is I don't have to guess where this is occurring. When I click on this, it's going to give me some more details. I can see where in time it's occurring. I can use the timeline to select the appropriate exception as well. Uh, so if I click on this, it'll navigate me to the right event for that. So now I understand where things are occurring in time. And if I double click or click Activate Historical Debugging, it's going to take me back in time in my source code to exactly where this exception occurred. So I can see that what's happening here is that for some reason we're getting a null reference exception. And if I go look in the debugger, the call stack window is showing me the, exactly what the call stack was at that point. If I go to the locals window, I can see the exception information, that it's a null reference exception. The message was objects not referenced to an instance, you know, my standard null reference exception. Um, the debugger doesn't collect the variable data by default simply because that would slow down your debugging session too much. But now this tells me where to put my breakpoint. So I'm going to go ahead and do this, and we're going to go ahead and resume debugging. I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to click a button again for one of the drivers that's not working. And so that's going to go ahead and hit that. And when I step, sure enough, I can see that the exception's occurring. So, yep. so I've hit it. So I'm going to go hover over here, and I'm going to go to driver.name. It turns out that the driver's name is null. You went and added your own name to the vehicle, didn't you? I guess you could say that's what happened. OK, well, you know, so normally if I go look at the driver here, normally we just associate the vehicle with a driver ID, because names oh. can change, things like that, right? So it's better to use an ID. Right. Um, so that's why for everybody that was in the system before you, we actually only have a driver ID associated with the vehicle. So that's why we're getting a null reference exception here. So I think all we're going to need to do to fix this particular issue is to query based on the driver ID as opposed to querying based on the driver name. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and test that out here in one of the debugger windows. I'm going to use the immediate window because it provides me a really nice uh, scratch pad. I'll drag this up nice and big so we can see it. Um, but I could do this in the watch window as well. And I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste. And in Visual Studio 2015, if you haven't seen it yet, I'm very pleased to announce that we support using Lambda expressions in the debugger when debugging C Sharp or Visual Basic. So driver.name, or sorry, not driver.name, that's what you did, driver.id equals d.driverid. And let's go ahead and test that out. 
And sure enough, that works like I'd expect. So great, we're gonna go ahead and take that fix. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go back up here. I'm gonna use another uh, trick in the debugger. It's called set next statement. So I'm able to grab this yellow instruction pointer, drag it back up here, and I can change the instruction the debugger is about to execute next. And then the last thing I'm gonna do here to go ahead and fix this particular issue, I'm gonna use what we call edit and continue. Gives me the ability to modify my code while I'm stopping the debugger. I don't need to stop and recompile. We don't need to wait for the web service to spin back up. And d.driverid equals driver.id. And in Visual Studio 2015, we also support edit and continue for Lambda expressions as well. So that was something that had never been there before either. So I'm gonna go ahead and step. The code change was applied. Rosalind just recompiled that for us. I can now see that the driver uh, worked correctly. So when I hit F5 and resume and come back, I can see that the driver loaded correctly. So I'm gonna go ahead and click this. It'll load up. So we've gone ahead and got that fixed. Um, but the next problem that I'm having is I'm not particularly pleased with the speed at which the drivers are loading. That's really slow. Yeah. Uh, performance is a feature, um, and I'm afraid we're going to lose some uh, customers over customers the speed of that. Our are busy. Event. They don't have time to wait around all day for Exactly. Us Nobody likes waiting on an app. Nope. So how am I going to go figure this out? Well, figuring out performance can be hard, but since I love the debugger, um, happen to work on it, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and set a breakpoint here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and click this, and let's go ahead, and as I step in the debugger, notice that I have this little uh, number that pops up off the right side of my code. It's really faint, it's kind of non-invasive when I don't care about it, but it's telling me that it took me less than or equal to one millisecond to run from this curly brace to the next line of code. That makes sense, I'm not doing anything in code. Uh, we call this a perf tip, and what a perf tip does is, as, as I said, perf tip tells me how long it took the, your code was running between two break states in the debugger. So it works when I step, it works when I run between breakpoints, so I'll go ahead and hit a five. That feels kind of slow, but now what happens is just as I'm running my code in the debugger and doing what I naturally do, um, I actually can measure with relative certainty how long things take, and I can see it's taking about 2.3 seconds, somewhere in that order, to go get the individual driver. So I'm gonna go back and step through my code and figure out where, um, where that's occurring, and that's slow. I have no idea what key I just hit, so we're gonna <laughs> see what happens. Oh, I hit step in too, that's the problem. That's slow, and when it comes back out, I can see it's about 2.1 seconds to go get the driver. And that actually makes sense. Remember I mentioned that we were using a web, another web service that already exists to get this data from. So um, I'm not gonna be able to work around the latency, but what I can do is I can make a change to cache the JSON string that I get back, and then I can just, we'll just use that. So we don't have to re-request the data every time. So let's say get individual driver uh, cached. So I already have that method uh, created. And since I stepped out, I'm gonna come back up here. Now I expect this to be slow the first time. And then when it comes back, I can see that it's about 197 milliseconds. So we just made about a 100%, or sorry, we just about an order of 10 improvement in the performance of our code. But I'm not done yet, that's not good enough for me. What? So I'm gonna click on the perf tip, because I wanna understand why it's taking 107 milliseconds. All I'm doing is getting one driver. Correct. So when I do this, I go back to my uh, diagnostic tools window, and um, when I go over here, I have not only events that are occurring, but I have process memory and a CPU graph. And I can see that I'm actually pegging the CPU a reasonable amount. This is showing me the percentage of all processors. So it's telling me that I was using 13% of all processors. Um, so on a quad core machine, I'm actually using over half of a processor. And so I wanna understand what's going on. So I'm gonna go to the CPU usage tab. And this was something new that we introduced in Visual Studio 2015 update one. Let me drag it bigger so you can see what's going on. And then it'll eventually refresh here in a second. Um, and so I can drill down through and I can actually see what code my application is do using where that CPU consumption is going. And so I can see that the get driver list is using about 20, about 30% of my CPU there, and it's being split between these different string utility functions, which when I hover over them, I can see that they're actually deserialization functions. So I mentioned that we were caching the JSON string, mm -hmm. um, but it actually turns out that simply deserializing that every time is gonna still incur a reasonable cost. So I'm gonna have to be a little bit more invasive and write a cache that's gonna store the post-serialized drivers. That actually makes sense, because we're including um, like image data and things like that with what, what we have. So I've already, already written that as well. I know, shocking, just like watching a cooking show. <laughs> Pre-made. And driver cache dot get individual driver. Let's go ahead and pass in our driver lookup, the same string that we have there. And so now, as I come back up here, F10, be slow the first time, because I expect it to go out, but then after that, we remember about 100 milliseconds before, and we're down to about two milliseconds now. 
So let's go ahead and hit F5. Let's test nice that out. Job. All right, so that's lightning fast. That's way faster. So I'm really pleased. We've spent uh, like less than 10 minutes and we've already improved the performance of our app by like a thousand and something percent. We're gonna make it big. It's gonna be great. Our management's gonna be so happy. I I'm really excited. I think you know one of them's right there. So I mentioned that um, you know having in running with IntelliTrace is great. Uh, so whenever I'm testing my app, I've learned, gotten in the habit of testing under the debugger. And as I zoom out here, I actually notice a, a, what seems like a, sm a trend here of a slight uptick in the memory of my app. So let me come back and just kind of keep clicking around, testing, uh, getting different drivers. What and as that? I come back he to seems like a nice driver. I bet he's a great driver. I think so too. Um, so as I come back here, I can see that you know there's a lot of GCs occurring, and there's definitely an uptick in the memory of my application. So not only do we have CPU tools integrated to the debugger, but we have memory tools integrated to the debugger. And everything that we're showing here, uh, memory and CPU and perf tips work for C Sharp, Visual Basic, and C++. Doesn't matter which one you're developing. I'm going to take a snapshot. And what this is going to do is this is going to give me a picture of what's going on in my application. So I can see the size of the heap, and I can see I'm only about 74 megabytes right now of managed memory. So that's not too bad. But let me keep testing. And I can take a snapshot whether I'm stopped in the debugger or whether I'm running live like I was right there. And so let me come back and let me hit a breakpoint uh, here. And I'll show you why I'm going to hit a breakpoint. Because there's one advantage of taking snapshots at a breakpoint over not being at a breakpoint. Oh, sorry. I have to actually click the button <laughs> first. Perfect. Take a snapshot. I can take as many snapshots as I want. So, you know, it only takes a couple couple seconds. And so I can see things that change between my snapshots when I take wow. them. And so the beauty of being integrated with the debugger is I can actually understand the memory impact of a single line of code, for example. So I can step over this line of code and I can say, take a snapshot, and I can see what changed simply between two lines of code. I can see actually in this case that even though a few number of objects went down, I increased by 10 megabytes of memory. That looks like a problem. And so, you know, so when I click on this, it's going to bring me into a diff view. And I'm going to go ahead and flip to um, show full view or full screen. So this is another thing you can do in Visual Studio. Visual Studio actually has four modes to the shell, not three. Um, you're intuitively familiar with three of them, whether you've thought about it or not. Uh, we have one mode before you have a project open in Visual Studio. That's what you see. You don't see any of the tool windows, Solution Explorer, things like that. We have one that's called Design Time when you have a solution open. You have the error list, the Solution right. Explorer, things like that. And then we have the Debug Mode, right, where we show all the debug windows. And then Full Screen Mode is yet a fourth one. So you can actually create customized window layouts. Visual Studio will remember that for you when you come back. And I really like Visual Studio for drilling into things like performance data like this. So we're here in the memory, uh, memory tool, and I can see because I'm diffed, and I can compare against all the baselines of the snapshots that I've had. So let's go back to the first snapshot that we took. And I can see in that time that I've added eight new drivers uh, for a total of an extra 73 megabytes. So that's a lot of data. I have a feeling if we run this up when uh, everybody out there decides to come hit our service that we may actually run out of memory pretty quick here. Yeah. I mean, look at all these people. I'm sure all of them want to take rides. So the advantage of being in the debugger that I mentioned, not only can you measure the imp code impact of one line of code, but when I click the view instances, I can come in here and I can now actually inspect all the values of the objects in my heap just like I'm debugging. So, and as I'm going down, I can see it looks like I have some sort of bug here in my caching logic that I introduced because there's a lot of copies of you. I'd only expect one copy of you in there. It's because I'm so awesome. Well, understood, but uh, we still only need one of you. All right, fine. I guess one's enough. It diminishes your value if there's more of you. This is, this is true. So when I'm on, a, on a, any given object, I can see the paths to root. This is telling me what's uh, the referencing the object. So it goes back to the GC roots. So this is what's preventing it from being garbage collected. And then I can flip around and I can look at reference types and I can see what it's holding on to. So drivers holding on to a byte array, that's the picture data we're sending with it. And then strings, those are the various properties that, that we have, things like name. Um, and so I can see here, because it's actually a static variable, which is my driver cache, that we actually even have the name of the variable. Um, you know, it tells me it's a home controller dot m underscore driver cache, and that's a static variable. If I go back out here to this view, when I pick a particular type, I also see the paths to root. This is simply aggregate of all the, the individual instances. And I can see that I've added an additional eight references in this uh, cache, which is, a, which is a dictionary. So it looks like somehow I screwed up my caching logic, and we're adding multiple copies to the cache every time we hit it. 
see. So let's go I'm ahead the and, only one capable in the and get here. out of full screen mode. Let's go uh, over to the definition of driver cache. So let me go ahead and just hit F12 to navigate to that. And you're going to notice this opens up in a temporary tab. So we call this a preview tab in Visual Studio. I'm going to unpin these windows. And the preview tab was created for the purposes of debugging. As you're stepping through code, when you stop debugging, it's not going to be there anymore. Um, if I want to do some serious edits in it, I can click this button and now it will be promoted to be a permanent tab. Nice. So what I want to do is I want to go into my uh, add item to cache and I'm going to add some logging on the fly. I don't want to have to edit my code, add temporary logging to figure out what's going on. So I'm going to hover over the breakpoint. I'm going to click this little settings icon or I could right click and choose actions. And what I can do is I can ask the debugger to log a message to the output window for me. I really love this functionality. It's really cool for stuff like this. Um, just like adding login on the fly, but I don't have to go back and pull anything out of code. And so let's print a message. So I'm going to say um, adding driver. And anything I put in curly braces is going to be uh, print the value of it at, at debug time. So I'm going to say key. So I'm going to go ahead and say adding driver key. Let's go ahead and close that. Let's go down here to getting driver. Let's add the same thing. Let's say actions getting driver. And let's dump the key that we're using. Perfect. So let's go ahead and, and continue debugging. Hopefully, I remember to take out my breakpoints. <laughs> and if not, we'll unset and if them. If not, we'll find out. That's right. All right. So let's go ahead and click this button a couple times. And so now, going back to the Dynac Tools window, if I'm if I have IntelliTrace, I can see that all of my trace points show as IntelliTrace events. And this is a way that you can do custom events because if I double click, IntelliTrace will actually take me back in time to where that trace point was hit. I can look at the call stack window as well. I can see the message that I printed. Um, if I don't have IntelliTrace, I can go to the output window and I can see all of my messages logged in the output window. And here I can see that I'm, every time I'm getting a driver, I'm also turning around and adding a driver. And it looks like that you added in the JavaScript UI when we make the request uh, some sort of sequence number for logging purposes. Is that correct? Yeah, that sounds, that sounds about right. OK, well, the only problem with that is that um, that's never going to be a unique key because every single time somebody comes in, we're never going to find you know, ID1, Allison Buckholtz, and, uh, and an increasing sequence number. So let's make a quick change to our code to um, using edit and continue again to go ahead and just extract the driver ID. So apparently anything but driver ID is actually evil in the purposes of this application. That's apparently what's All right, so let's us. go ahead and run this. Let's click our button. And if I come back into Visual Studio and I look in the output window, I'm going to see that as I scroll down, I added the driver once and then I got the driver, got the driver, got the driver. I clicked a different driver, so it's a different okay. driver ID. But let's go back here and go. I'm going to have and a sure really enough, busy we're getting, 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 getting. So we're not adding any more drivers to the cache. And awesome. if we go back here to our diagnostic tools window, I can see that my memory has now flattened out. And I'm not sure getting any more GCs despite how many times I retrieve the driver. Nice. That's awesome. So with that, let's quickly come back uh, to our PowerPoint. And so there is a very quick review of what we just talked about. And so at this point, Allison, um, I was thinking that maybe we should kick it over. And given that we had the issue um, a minute ago where you happen to be the only driver that worked, maybe we could write a unit test to make sure that as we make changes going forward that it's going to work for everybody. OK. I mean, that sounds like a reasonable request, I guess. Um, so as we always said, you know, through the magic of demos, a lot of this is already done because the last thing I want to do is bore you while I sit up here and try to type and misspell everything. So this unit test is mostly done except for one line here. And what we're going to do is create this driver cache object. So it's interesting. We talked about, you know, things I did. Andrew just worked in the driver cache. So, you know, we're going to make sure that that's working well, too. So, so quick question for you, Allison. I see mm -hmm. you have a to-do comment in the code. Is there any way that Visual Studio tracks to-dos for me? Yeah, there is a way they do it. I believe it's with our task list, which we can get with control Q, which is our quick launch. And then we can type in task list, and we can get our view right here. So it tells me that in drivercache.cs, there is some implement something here. I don't know who would have put that there. Um, and then here in create driver cache object, which is what I did. So there is a very quick and easy way to get to all of your to-dos so you don't lose track of one of them. Yeah, that's awesome, because I feel like I put to-dos all the time, and then I have to control F to go find them. So I never knew that they showed up in the test list. That's awesome. Yeah, so maybe next time you won't have this, uh, this random one just hanging out. <laughs> all right, so let's create this object. 
So I could write out driver cache, but I'm lazy sometimes. And if I remember that IntelliSense can actually match on camel casing, what I can do is actually just write DC, and you'll notice that driver cache actually shows up. So we're gonna name this, and we're gonna make a new one. And if you notice, as soon as I hit space, IntelliSense is awesome, it remembers the last thing I wrote, um, which is driver cache, which is what I want. But maybe, you know, for instance, I wanna be able to see what's underneath um, this tab, this box. And, you know, maybe driver cache takes some argument, and I'm not sure how many it takes. What I can do is press control, and this pane goes transparent. So I can see what's underneath it. The box isn't gone, it comes right back, but as long as I have control pressed, I can see what's underneath, so it's out of my way. So I actually do want driver cache, so I'm gonna hit enter and do a semicolon there, and we're gonna be all set. So this should theoretically be done for our unit test, but you know, I, I feel like investigating some of this stuff a little further. I wanna get a feel for what Andrew's doing here. So this get driver from driver list I saw Andrew using, and you know, I wanna check it out a little bit. I could just hit F12 and that would open a new, you know, document, but I just sort of wanna peek inside of it. So instead, I can do Alt F12, and it gives me this great peak definition right in line here. So I don't have to leave my unit test file. I get to explore things right here. So looking around, I'm kind of noticing that I have a red squiggly line, which tends to be bad news. Pretty much means I made a mistake somewhere. But the great thing is, you know, Visual Studio gives me help. I'm not alone. If I hit control period, then I actually get these great light bulbs which have suggested ways of remedying this problem. So it looks like I forgot to include um, this using directive. So if I select that, go ahead and hit enter, everything looks great. The red squiggly lines disappear and everyone's happy again. Um, and actually, you know what? Driver lookup request also looks interesting. So I'm gonna peek into that. So now I have two peak windows, and if you notice, we have these two little dots that appeared, and that let us know, those let us know that we can actually navigate between these two things that we've peeked into. Now, if you're like me, these, these are tiny little buttons. They're hard to press sometimes. Um, I always miss them. So instead, you can actually use your keyboard, and you can do Control-Alt-Minus or Control-Alt-Equals to navigate back and forth. So I think driver cache looks kind of interesting. I want to look at this a little bit more. You notice as soon as we promoted it, it actually kept our reference to this get driver from driver list and kept it right at the top, so it's not that disorienting. We know exactly where we are. And as you notice above this, we have these light gray, slightly smaller text. And what this is, code lens. And code lens allows you to get a better idea of where um, this function is being called, the blame game, as we like to call it, of who modified it last, as well as if you notice zero out of one passing. So this will also give you the unit tests that are either passing or failing. So quick question, Allison. I remember that Code Lens used to be in enterprise only. Is it still? No, it's actually also in Pro for 2015. So if you have Visual Studio Pro, Code Lens is now available to you. Very cool. Yeah, very cool. So let's actually inspect some of this Code Lens stuff. So you could click on any of these, but in you know the spirit of keyboard shortcuts, if you hit Alt, you'll notice that you can quick access any of these by the numbers on top of them. So I'm interested in our test, so I'm gonna hit three. Turns out we haven't run this yet, so I'm gonna go ahead and run all. It's gonna go through a quick build, or rather, hopefully, quick build. Um, and while we're waiting for that, oh, there it is, it finished. So if we actually go back to Code Lens and we hit Alt-3, we get this lovely green check mark telling us that yes, in fact, it has passed. We have not messed up our application any further. If you wanna navigate back and forth um, besides you know, Alt-3 or Alt-5, you can also do Alt-Left and Right while one of these Code Lens windows is open. So we can see here, um, Git driver from driverless is referenced in these two places. We see that our tests are passing all of the work that Andrew and I have been doing in the last, you know, week and a half for this demo, and then all of the commits that are associated with these changes. Cool, so now that we have code lens there, I think we're all set. The tests seem to be passing, I think we're pretty solid. I'm gonna go ahead and commit this and get it up to the cloud so that we can, you can continue working. So for those of you who have used update one, you might notice the branch switcher and the repository uh, information down here in the status bar. 
but we've also added an update to two more quick controls. So this one right here is gonna be your pending changes. These are the number of files that you've touched. So it gives you a good idea of how the magnitude of changes that you've made in a sense. So if you go ahead and click it at any given point, it will bring you straight to the changes page in Team Explorer so that you can quickly commit. So I'm gonna go ahead and say unit test, done. And we're gonna go ahead, we see the changes that are gonna be committed. We're gonna go ahead and commit all. And then one thing that you might have noticed, although it was a little you know, subtle, is this one here are your unpublished commits. So these are the number of local commits that haven't actually been synced with your server. So you know if this number gets really high, it's sort of a nice reminder that maybe before you go home at the end of the day, you wanna make sure that your commits are synced with the server. So that's what I'm gonna go ahead and do now. We can go ahead and push this to make sure that all of these things, and look at that, the network was nice for me this time. So with that, I'm gonna kick it back over to Andrew, and here uh, you'll see all of the quick things that we talked about in this third part of the demo. Awesome, thanks Allison. So I've gone ahead and pulled your uh, changes down here. So the first thing I wanna do is I see that you've added this unit test one, mm -hmm. and um, maybe we should give that a more descriptive name. So one of the nice things about Visual Studio, if you've never done before, I can rename the class here, but it's not gonna update the name of the file. However, if I right click and I rename using Solution Explorer, let's call these uh, driver tests, it's gonna actually offer to update the name of the class for me as well. What? So if I go ahead and say yes, um, changing the name of something through Solution Explorer actually updates the name of the class, assuming that, that those two match, whereas simply updating it in the editor using the refactoring and renaming capabilities isn't gonna change the name of the file. Ooh. So we've, gonna, we've got that cleaned up. Okay. Um, I think what we're gonna do here is we're gonna ultimately push this into production and test it out. I think we're about ready to go. Um, but I wanna do just a little bit more cleanup, taking advantage of, of a few things. Um, so first thing I wanna do is I find myself, uh, you know, I wrote that cache and that was a bit of, of effort. And actually I find myself writing caches all the time in, in Visual Studio. There's actually two pieces of code that, I've, that I continually am going and finding old projects and copying and pasting back into my new projects. Mm -hmm. One is caches like I implemented uh, here, and the other one is view models when I'm dealing with uh, WPF or XAML code. And so what I wanna do here is I'm gonna actually uh, extract out, I've created this, I created it with a cache base. So I have a base class that I can just inherit from, and it handles all of the interesting logic for me, including it has like a lifetime, and so it's set to kick all, like, you know, retrieve new objects every 30 minutes and stuff. So I'm pretty proud of this. So good what, code. Yeah, it's, it's a good code. So what I would like to do is I'd actually like to extract this and turn it into what's called a code snippet. So when I'm doing these projects in the future, then Visual Studio, I can just right click and say add code snippet and it'll inject this code for me. So to do that, I've uh, just done a quick search for uh, code, creating code snippet in Visual Studio and it found a lovely uh, template for me. So I'm gonna come back to Visual Studio. I'm simply gonna, uh, let's go ahead and create a solution folder here. So I'm gonna go ahead uh, down here and I'm gonna say add new solution folder. So this is a great way to just keep track of random solution items that I have. And I'm gonna go ahead and call this uh, code snippets. And so now I'm gonna right click on that. And I'm gonna say add new item. I'm just gonna create a regular old XML file and we're gonna call it uh, cache.snippet. And when I do this, I simply have to populate three fields. So we're gonna call this uh, local cache. Uh, code language is C sharp, and it's actually, we spell out sharp, it's not a pound sign. I got bit by that the first time I did this. <laughs> and so then let's go ahead and save that. Let's go back to driver cache. And so I'm gonna go down here to the bottom of my driver cache, and notice that Visual Studio does the nice uh, bracket highlighting, but given this resolution, I can't see the top. But if I hit Control Shift N bracket, it's gonna actually jump up to the top. So Control Shift N bracket jumps back and forth between um, the beginning and end bracket. I know it's not quite intuitive that control end bracket jumps to the beginning bracket as well. But control shift, when I hold shift down, that's always gonna be the cue to Windows to do that. Now let's go ahead and hit control X to go ahead and delete this. And so that's gone. Um, Microsoft wants me to install BitLocker. <laughs> control shift to escape. Uh, brings up task manager if you didn't know that. And end task and that in its tracks. So now that I have my, my code snippet here, I'm just gonna go ahead and paste uh, that snippet in there. And now what I'm gonna do is I need to add this into Visual Studio. So I'm just gonna right click on the tab here and I'm gonna say copy full path. So you can open the containing folder or do a copy full path right from the tab in the editor in Visual Studio. So when I say copy full path, 
I'm going to go debug, or not debug, sorry, um, <laughs> bias there, yeah. tools, code snippet manager, and I'm going to go ahead and import a code snippet. I'm simply going to paste the full path that I copied before. Makes sense. And when I do that, I'm going to put it in my code snippets, and we're going to go ahead and hit enter, and we hope that, all right, let's go, oh, there we go, <laughs> visual C sharp, my code snippets, awesome, go import. Awesome. My, My code snippets. And it's I unfortunate this resolution. resolution. Isn't it great, guys? All right. Let's go ahead and make that. <laughs> and if that would All right. So anyway, so if it I had the, had the code snippet, let's pretend that it was there. And so then what that would do is then I could simply insert it. So I can show actually using code snippets in another way that I really like. So for example, if you just want to insert some code here, I could right click and you can say insert snippet, and then it would have shown up in my snippets. I could say ASP.NET MVC4, and I can, for example, inject a post action snippet. So it would have offered to inject my cache. So I could save my own cache um, and inject, save my own code samples that way. And I'm going to go ahead and check this in with the source control so you can take advantage of, of that as well. Awesome. I uh, while we're on code snippets, um, have you ever tried to create a try catch around something? And you kind of copy and like create yeah. the try catch and then copy and paste. To like mess around in the middle and it just. It's yeah, more so Visual trouble. Studio, you can right click, you can say surround with, and that's Control K, Control S. We put the keyboard shortcuts next to all of the context menu items. So that tends to be how I learn the keyboard shortcuts for things. I find the mouse, I hover over, look at the tooltip, find the context menu, and I can say surround with, and I get this great list of things. Uh, type ahead works, so I can say try. And I can say try catch, and it automatically wraps it. So no more creating the try catch, like enter, copy paste, like move stuff out. up. Uh, some other fun things about code snippets that I really had never known existed in Visual Studio until, until recently is when you're trying to create code, you can just type, uh, let's say I want to create a for loop here, for example, and I can okay. say for tab tab, and it's going to automatically inject that for loop body for me. And then I can tab between the properties that I want to set. So let's say I don't want it to be I, I want it to be X. And so, boom, it automatically updates all the X's oh. for me. And then I don't actually have a length, but I do have a key dot to string dot length. Perfect. And so now that injected a for loop for me. So I hit enter, and boom, now I can just type inside that. So without ever having to take my hands off the keyboard, I can actually just create the body of a for loop really quick. That works for things like try finally too. So if you just type try F, boom, boom. And the IntelliSense box is actually popping up the whole time and showing me what I can do. So I just have to hit tab, tab. So if I type like if, I could choose, you know, pound if. If I wanted to do an if def, I could say debug. So code snippets are a really handy way to just use tab functionality, type a couple things, hit tab, tab, and then Visual Studio is going to go ahead and plug all that functionality in for me. So I'm going to go ahead and control Z all this. I don't actually need to need to take any of those changes. Uh, you said you had a unit test for us, right? Yep. So let's just go ahead and make sure that, um, let's go ahead and open folder in File Explorer, and I want to look at my solution. And it looks like you added the myshuttle.tests um, in the root directory of our solution, not in the test folder. Visual Studio did that. That, okay. that wasn't me. Um, since this is a power user talk, I felt like we couldn't get away from a power user talk with what to do when things are created in the wrong location, because this happens to me all the time, to be honest. Uh, Visual Studio somehow doesn't magically know what folder I want things in when I don't want them in the defaults, and I don't pay attention when I create new yeah. projects, and they end up in the wrong place. So uh, all I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and um, let's get dangerous. I'm going to right click on this. Dangerous. And I'm going to say unload project. Yeah, let's go ahead and save it. And so now I'm going to grab this and I'm going to drag it down here into our test folder. And now what I need to do is I need to modify, so we're going to open with Notepad, the, Ooh. yeah, that's right. <laughs> Power user don't know that. We're and let's go ahead and back. say this is in test slash, so I just need to update the reference to the path where the project is. So that's here at the top. So it's test slash my shuttle. That's the relative path to the SLN file. And then when I come down here, I'm going to go ahead and say, I'm going to edit this and reload project. Now I'm going to edit it. Edit my shuttle.txt All right, we're going to go ahead and close our solution. Yes. And then we're going to go edit the, we just need to update the references to the other projects as well. So I'm going to say test, my shuttle.txt, CS proj, open with notepad, any good demo. <laughs> and then we simply need to find the, um, SRC, so that was the directory that we were referencing this one. 
and we go dot dot. Oh, sorry. Oh. Boom, boom. So that Looking does that. Good. Awesome. And now, Visual Studio. Now reload. Should work correctly. So, all right. Now that we, I don't know. Where we're <laughs> But that's how you that's how you do it. So only only we on promise stage, it things works. fail. Trust me. What's a demo without some hiccups, right? All right. So Allison, we are now in um, ready to put this in production. We yeah. clean up. We, we did our changes. I'm ready so to get driving. So I've gone ahead and I've installed this on the production machine. Cool. So let's just uh, we're binding to port 8080, and let's go ahead and hit that. And it's going to fire up, and it's going to not I don't think actually it's work. No, it's not working. That seems to be the trend of the day right now. It is the trend of the day. I, I, I concur. So <laughs> I think I actually want to set this up, and I want to debug this. Okay. Now, I could set up remote debugging, but I've decided I that uh, I'm not quite sane, and I'm going to test my luck, and I'm going to actually install Visual Studio on the machine to debug this locally. We've got 14 minutes. I, I understand. These people have to get to dinner. Uh, well, they'll wait a few, a few I mean, minutes. I guess they could come back, and then maybe it'll be installed. I, I'm going to make a bet with you that I can install Visual Studio in under a minute on this machine. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm pretty, pretty confident taking that money. Um, I don't know how much you want to bet here. All right, but, are we going to uh, bet dinner on this? I'm down. All right, so I'm gonna, I've copied over the new Visual Studio 15 installer onto the machine. So this is the 15 preview that we shipped. And you can see that what we are offering is we are offering functionality that you can pick. Um, so what, you know, right now we have core editor, we have .NET desktop development, Unity, Python, C++, and we have more coming soon. For example, we'll be adding ASP.NET. So I'm going to go ahead and click off the install, and we can talk about this a little bit more. So let's go ahead and click our timer. Remember, I said one minute. Okay. I'm so while I'm doing this, I want to give a quick plug. Carl Melder is our UX researcher. <laughs> He's in the back of the room raising a flash voting sign. And I told you that you could help us do uh, improve Visual Studio in three minutes. If you're on your way out, you'd stop and talk to him. We really want to understand how we can make this installer in Visual Studio 15 work for you. What is the type of stuff that you want to do? So Allison, we're at uh, 27 seconds. Okay. What do you think my odds of success are? Uh, right now? My odds of failure are looking pretty high right now, which would as I said, be the trend right now. I'm actually into the licensing no. phase. Look at the progress. Oh, Mark. there's still time. Licensing is finicky. You never know. Oh, God. Ugh. I think I'm going to succeed. I said under a minute, right? You, you did say under a minute. Boom. Setup completed. 49, 49 seconds. No. Visual is, Studio 15 is installed. No. This is some black magic up in here. So I'm going to go ahead and click launch. And okay. you can see the description here. It tells me that I have my code editor. It has TextMate bundles. Um, and it has basic debugging. So we have a managed application. So I'm going to go ahead and click launch. Uh, for the purposes of now, I'm going to go ahead and click the uh, skipping the sign in. We'll just take the default settings. And so I need to go ahead and actually launch Visual Studio as an administrator now, um, simply because I need to debug IIS. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Control shift enter and that's going to launch Visual Studio as an administrator. And so now what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and open folder. Well, that's new. Yeah, open folder is new. So in Visual Studio, if you ever wanted to just look at code without creating a solution file, and let's go down to uh, where our project is. It's on my C drive. And so I'm just going to take my shuttle.client.web. And so now Solutions and Explorer is going to be populated with all the relevant stuff associated with my client.web. But there's, there's no solution in there. There's no solution in there. Simply open folder, and this works. Oh, all all right. Right. Remember, I, I said debugging works. So let's go ahead and attach the process. As I said, this is black magic. All right, I'm going to click Show from All Users, W3WP, Type Ahead Works, and I need the VS Shuttle application pool. So we're going to go ahead and attach. Remember, a less than one minute install. Y'all ignore the security yes. warning. I trust my <laughs> we own trust process. It. So now what I'm going to do, uh, really quickly before I start debugging, is I'm going to turn on one new preview thing that we've shipped in Visual Studio 15 as well from the debugger. And it says, use the new exception helper. So I'll show what this means in a minute. Then I'm going to open my exception settings window, debug windows exception settings. And I'm going to ask the debugger to break whenever any of the managed language exceptions are thrown in my application. Okay. So it's going to go ahead and do that. So now when I go ahead and come back here, and let's go ahead and refresh this page, I'm going to expect the debugger to break. And it's going to ask me where this base request uh, file.cs is. So 
I just dropped it here in the share directory. Um, this is from the shared library. So the, the debugger is going to find it. It's going to break. And this is the new exception helper that I was, uh, went and opted on. So you can try this out in Visual Studio Preview uh, 15 today. And notice that it wasn't that giant dialog that popped up on top of my code. It tells me that I had a system aggregate exception, but then it also, just in this view, shows me the inner exception instantly. Wow. So I can see that an error occurred while sending the request. All right, so if I go ahead and look down here, so I have, uh, I mentioned that I have full debugging, so I can type in the URL in my watch window. And that'll populate. And I can see that what happened was I forgot to update my connection string in my oh. web.config file. I'm sure no one's ever done that when pushing something into to a different Obviously machine. Obviously not. All right, so let's go. Uh, remember we, we opened our folder. So I have the web.config file right here. Awesome. Let's go ahead and normalize the line endings. And uh, again, because I am good at demos, I have <laughs> the fix all ready to go. And so we are going to simply use the connection string that's referencing it on the local machine. Because now that we're on the production machine, we're actually running our services on the same machine. Awesome. And so let's go ahead and just comment this out. Do do. And boom. Looking good. Let's go ahead and save that. Let's resume the process now. And then and let's go ahead and Moment of truth. No exceptions hit yet. <gasps> And it works. Look at that. So I actually think now with Visual Studio 15, it is faster to go install Visual Studio from a USB key on that machine. It's, almost, it's supposed to be zero impact. It's yep. not going to mess up my machine. Then it is to actually go through the hassle of calling my admin, getting the firewall oh. rules changed so I can actually remote debug to that production machine. Yep. That is, well, I guess, I feel like you're going to take advantage of this dinner. So I'm just going to cancel my vacation for That's uh, right. For We're next going week. somewhere really nice. Oh, all right. You deserve it, I guess. All right, so that's a very, very brief um, review of what we talked about there. So I mentioned uh, making Visual Studio better. So you can send feedback to us using the Visual Studio feedback tool. This is something that I think is really important to emphasize. I'm going to come back to my machine right now. And anytime you're using Visual Studio, we have this little icon up here that says send feedback. And you can report a problem or provide a suggestion. And I promise that we pay people to actually look at every single thing that you report. I can't I promise that you're going to get an email back, but somebody will actually look at that problem if you report it that way or provide a suggestion. Yeah, I personally triage those every day. So you'll just be talking directly. Uh, to remember, me. hit Carl on the way out for the voting. We know it's late, so we're going to uh, let you out of here a few minutes early. The Diagnostics blog, here's some resources. This is where we post all the new debugging stuff the Visual Studio blog, uh, two talks. There was a debugging tips and tricks talk in here last night. There was the future of Visual Studio talk. Um, so those are great talks to go watch if you want to understand more about where we're going with the installation experience, if you want to see more about the debugger. And please complete an evaluation for us. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much.